Page 18. A Short Introduction to the History of Human Stupidity, Walter B. Pitkin, 1932. Pearl Igomenon. Ingress. 1.1. Motives. Why should one of the few incorrigible optimists remaining on Earth undertake a short introduction to the history of human stupidity? Is the venture foolish, and the adventurer stupider than all his many specimens? No. For the human race has reached an impasse from which it can escape only by fresh inquiry into its own shortcomings and imperfections. Here we are, in this year of grace, 1932, masters of earth and air, fire and water. We fly faster than the birds. We dive the deeps. We disembowel mountains and chew forests to chaff. Over nature we exercise powers much vaster than our forefathers credited to the gods. But are we gods? Hardly one demons perhaps. And of earth we have made pandemonium. For every billion in coin value that ingenious men have added to our store, other men have destroyed a billion, sometimes in coin value, sometimes in human worth, by wars, tricks, speculations, gaming, fraud, chicaneries plagues, lies, outrages, and, above all, mortal dullness. For every cunning fashion work which some thinker has devised for making cheap the good usables, others who cannot think have profiteered and defrauded and mismanaged colossally, so that as fast as wealth piles up somewhere, decay and misery abound elsewhere in harmonious equations. While the Texas cotton grower starves because his fields cannot feed him by reason of their abundance, the Hanko coolie goes naked. While the Kansas sweet farmer deserts his homestead and wanders, with pots and pans and brats, to the nearest city breadline for a square meal, mountains of wheat lie on the ground all over the Great Plains. While bankers complain of having a surfeit of idle money in their vaults, they refuse to lend a dollar to meritorious enterprises. While the ranks of the idle swell, Governments spend tens of millions of dollars daily on guns and shells and battleships. While we increase school funds, build more and more magnificent school buildings, and train school teachers ever more intensively, pupils study worse, learn less, and grow up into shoddy citizenship, an easy prey for gangster lures, for criminal masterminds, and a perennial market for worthless stocks and bonds. While the pace of business grows faster, Addicts devour more and more morphine, cocaine, and heroin until we Americans now attain the bad eminence of using more narcotics by far than any other people. Some combinations of motives, perceptions, and methods have, so the statisticians tell us, cost, every year, in our own land alone, the equivalent of $25 billion to $30 billion in lost money, lost time, lost health, and lost happiness through the channels of manufacturing and distribution and finance alone. Since we brought back our fighting men from Europe in 1918, we have thus lost or wasted a sum sufficient to buy every railroad, land, cars, tracks, and stations every steamboat, every factory, store, farm, tool, machine, implement, automobile, horse, cow, sheep, hog, hen, electric light plant, telephone, and pavement now existing in these United States. Between the Civil War and the World War, inclusive, our fathers and grandfathers, aided and abetted by the female of the species, no doubt, squandered in like manner enough to equip half of Europe with homes, roads and factories. For all our boasts of efficiency and wealth, we are not much more than 25% as efficient and rich as we might have been if. If what? The answer discloses the motives of the present inquiry. If our business leaders, our political leaders, our bankers, our voters, and ourselves in general had only been better informed, more thoroughly educated, less dull, less suspicious, less greedy, less poisoned with the gambler's diseased spirit, more far-sighted, and more completely aware of the kind of a world we inhabit as well as of the people who dwell here, we might have made more of our matchless opportunities. We might not now be sinking into the stale and unprofitable ways of the old world, which, as we sink, 
moves like a blind and stricken beast still further downward into the bogs of Asia. Does anybody deny this? If so, I do not know him. The world admits itself awry because people are awry. Well, what's wrong with them? Is it lack of religion? Or bad schooling? Or perverse emotions? Or ill health? Or inane traditions? Or corruption of customs and manners? Or superstition? Or poverty? Or ignorance? Or decayed endocrine glands? Or an obscure trend in mutations and chromosomes? Or something which not even the wisest has yet suspected? Surely somebody must answer the question. Until you come into the clear as to the nature, drift, and causes of our manifold faults, we cannot remedy them. We remain doctors scribbling prescriptions in the dark for patients we have never met. Therefore, I declare, the next major enterprise of the human race should be self-analysis. It must begin with a search for the dominant influences in the crumbling and rot of the social economic order. While bankers and butchers investigate the gold supply and overproduction of meat choppers, those who concern themselves with human nature must investigate its peculiar contributions to the woes of this 20th century. We might well have launched our inquiry with a survey of human ignorance, or with one of ill will, or one of the errors rooted in institutions. We prefer stupidity, however, because it seems to underlie all the others and to spread its virus further and more subtly. A thorough inquiry into stupid people and their acts has become a major issue of statesmanship. Hence no statesman will pay the slightest attention to it. But people who avoid politics as they would leprosy may be curious to know more about the matter, and, first of all, they may demand an explanation of my odd assertion. Here it is, in miniature. Its complete expression is this short introduction as a whole. Scientists, and nobody else, have discovered and invented so many revolutionary things during the past few generations that today, as we approach the middle of the 20th century, we find the human race confronted with two major crises. One is the crisis of the best, the other is the crisis of the worst. Each crisis crops out in a dozen or more fields of human endeavor. We come upon it in our schools, in our hospitals, in our private endowments for the alleviation of poverty, suffering and ignorance, in our national policies, especially in so far as they concern the conquest of new areas to provide for surplus populations, in our dealings with the vast underworld of crime, in our efforts to cope with disrespect for law on the part of citizens not ordinarily regarded as criminals in our efforts to secure sane legislation in place of fanaticism, in our struggles to solve technological unemployment, and, perhaps above all, in our thus far frustrated endeavors to purge the politics of democracy, which is thoroughly diseased with the poisons of the Cyclopean evil. Already the world suffers acutely from a serious unbalance at two points. We have an excess of best minds and second best minds relative to jobs which utilize their high abilities. And we also have an appalling surplus of stupids and humanesques, relative to jobs which utilize their low abilities. The first crisis I have investigated as far as my own time and resources would permit, among other things, it appears that, within the next 35 or 40 years, the Leading nations of the world will have drained between 2,500,000 and 4 million scientists, technicians, and engineers, in that day, organization methods will have become so perfected that each worker will complete fully twice as many units of performance as is common today. Then too, the further subdividing and specializing of complex tasks will have reduced to a minimum the demands upon the ablest men. It is quite conceivable that some great surgeons will have clinics so transformed that their assistants will successfully handle all save one or two operations a month. Great engineers will have even less to do. And great teachers, in 1975, will not waste their precious hours talking to 10 or 20 students in a chalk dusty classroom but will speak to a million every morning over the radio television, and will have all their best thoughts well canned in phonograph records all of which will enormously reduce the number of great teachers required for educating any given number of people. Already we have, in the United States, 
more than 400,000 such high-grade people, mostly untrained, to be sure, who could and would work in the sciences and the professions, if only they could find agreeable and remunerative employment there. But they cannot, save only in medicine and dentistry, for which, of course, few are suited by mind or temperament. If we widen our inquiry to embrace the 10% of our total population having the best intelligence and all-around personalities, we find, by a series of computations too long to report here, that nearly 5 million of these, of all age groups, will never be able to find adequate opportunities for careers. At the other end of the scale what appears? Now you know. For the press has long been filled with the sad tales of the machine age and the technological unemployment it causes, along with the steadily dwindling number of workers needed for each unit of production or personal service. You likewise know that the subdividing of labor reaches the point where the unit operation becomes so simple that even morons can handle it well, in many instances. Every year the major industries approach closer to their ideal which is a working staff in which about five men are high-grade experts and some 95 are common laborers who, after six or eight weeks of drill under a foreman, do their appointed tasks well enough. Our shocking farm crisis is largely one growing out of mechanized production with a small fraction of the field workers required a generation ago. Whereas once nearly half of the total population had to sweat over crops in order to feed themselves and the other half, Today one man easily supports himself and ten others, with modern chemicals and instruments. By 1975 one farmer will be supported by 40 city eaters. And then the man with a hoe must move back to the caverns of his elder brother, Cyclops. The big world will have no job for him. Here is a novel predicament of this human race. On the way to utopia, our best and our worst suffer first and worst. Would we progress? then somehow we must find ways and means of assuring the best of a fair chance of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, while we eliminate the worst in some manner which does not outrage the feeble, flickering moral sense of mankind. But what has been done thus far? Well, our biologists have drawn into the fray sundry regiments of eugenists which are fighting under different flags, with no central generalship, hence somewhat vainly. Some attack the problem of the worst, some that of the best, nobody attacks the problem as a whole. One group works nobly for birth control, which is excellent. Another works for sterilization of the insane and feeble-minded, which is also admirable, if well managed. Still another, and smaller, group seeks a method of detecting and encouraging genius. A fourth looks to the improvement of higher education as a way of salvaging that vast army below genius and above the racial average. A fifth group attacks crime, a sixth promiscuous immigration, and so on. But, so far as I can ascertain, not a soul has thus far given thought to the possible consequences of the slow, mainly invisible accumulation of blunders, errors, prejudices, bigotries fanaticisms and crimes caused by dullness in the hundreds of millions of people who are by no means feeble-minded nor insane nor psychopathic. The more deeply we probe into natural processes, the more we are overwhelmed by the spectacle of an infinitude of minute forces massing in the causation of ordinary events. The history of mankind is not written by a few geniuses, generals, and criminals. The extreme types of personality attract undue attention get into the headlines, and are later exploited by biographers. But the stream of life down which they swim is a million times broader and deeper and older than they, and it is composed of trillions of drops of water, which in turn are made up of sextillions of molecules, and so on ad ignotum. So, it would appear to me, the statesman who dreams of an almost perfect society must someday be forced to observe analyze and overcome the common frailties of the common people, among which no frailty is more pernicious than simple dullness. Page 23